um, <clears throat> that uh, kind of further reflect, reflecting on, is it Patricia's comments that were brought up about kind of Mexico, Iran, um, basically more of a global cities perspective, that safety is the first issue, right, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the way that we can think about the, the book that we wrote in Copenhagen is kind of a scenario or case study is that the, in many ways, the street fights are like a football game. It's, it's similar, right? A soccer game. Copenhagen is just at the end of the match. So in many ways, or they're going into overtime. So in many ways, the match is kind of similar in different cities. At the very beginning, safety was also like at the core of, of the, <laughs> oh, <laughs> core of the street fight in um, Copenhagen. And that was addressed um, already back in the 1920s, right? So a hundred years ahead, potentially, of, uh, of what's happening in, um, in Mexico. So it's, um, there's a lot of critique of kind of talking about this Copenhagenization and uh, Global North perspective. And I think that's very valid and should be taken into perspective. Yet at the same time, there's still something to be learned. So I don't think it's very constructive to dismiss a case study just because it's Global North. Yet we also need to kind of think about the variegated situations and of course, like the very situated reality of the case study that you might be bringing up or the reality of um, if we're thinking about Tehran or if we're thinking about Mexico City, Mexico City, just the basic reality that safety is not taken into account. So, but let's see uh, what the video has to say about this issue and then we have some nice discussions to go into. Great, so um, very interesting video. I think touching actually on a lot of the, the topics that we have brought up um, in our discussion so far. Uh, which group is ready to lead the discussion? Working group three, yes. Great. Please take the stage. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, there are four questions. Uh, four of us in working group three will initiate the discussion of this question. For, I'm responsible for question number one about language of right. Great. So the language of right has uh, come to be used so widely within this uh, public transport and continues to be expanded in more and more, developed more and more. I was searching the internet to read more about this language of right. Uh, and I saw a really interesting uh, paper. I will share the link with you uh, after that, uh, which was talking about the language of right exactly. When we're talking about this language of right, it uh, might become a little bit controversial and tricky because uh, it seems that uh, there is a conflict between language of rights with S and language of right. And the question is that uh, the concept of the right, is it unitary or multiple one? And if it is multiple, what are different aspects of this right and in what respect it is multiple? Uh, I, I want to share this, yeah. Uh, yeah. I copied this article that I read in, in the chat room so you can after what, read about it. Uh, yes, the, uh, this is it. I just, it just, I think it's a good starting point for this discussion about the language of rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll take all four questions first and then we can kind of uh, go into discussion about them. So thank you, uh, Hassan. You're welcome. Who's the next person taking up a question? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Hassan on the first uh, question that there's a, there's a um, historical background, especially in philosophy, about the language of rights and, and then utilitarian ethics, but, but maybe it's going too deep into that already. Um, but the second question um, is about uh, the practices of inclusion and exclusion implicit in transportation infrastructure. And, and we, we discussed it from, from a, um, a number of points, and, and obviously we, we thought that there are no neutral choices. You know, every choice you make about infrastructure, you tend to exclude some group in, 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 in favor of, of some others. So, and, and clearly, uh, buses 
in terms of, for example, affordability, bus tickets are more affordable to most people than, than cars and, and bicycles are more affordable to some people, to most people than cars. Um, so, so clearly you can say that buses are, are sort of more democratic in that sense. And, and we also discussed uh, an example from, from the country where I live, Estonia, where our capital city has gone maybe even one step further. So, so they've made um, a public transport free for everyone or for the city residents. So, so not, not only do you have um, uh, the, the infrastructure development prioritized, but you have the free access to the service. Uh, um, and then we also discussed that it's not only about rich versus the poor, but it's also, it might be exclusion on the basis of age. For example, in the video, they talked about children and how much a space do we have in the cities for children or, and also for old people. Uh, and, 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 and there's also, uh, it can be on, 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 on gender basis. So how much, uh, how much do we accommodate uh, the, the, the well, that women have some sort of different uh, practices of, of, of mobility, perhaps, and they favor different modes of transport, for example, women with children. So how accessible is the infrastructure for them? So there can be uh, different ways of inclusion uh, and exclusion. Great, thank you. Those are some really interesting uh, reflections. Here I am standing up with my uh, <laughs> newborn. So I'm trying to keep the mic muted so that she doesn't grunt too much. But um, I, I'm taking notes. So Silver, I've gotten down your comments about uh, free public transit in Tallinn. Who has the right to mobility? I think this is essentially the, the question that you're raising. Both of you have kind of touched on. Who's the next person to, to share some insights? I think it's Nicosia. Yeah, Nicosia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Uh, mine is last question, I think. As per the recommendation, uh, as developing countries in Africa and Asia are yet to develop, I mean, yet to urbanize. So they can take opportunities to acquire land around the urban area so that they can make the, their uh, plan accordingly. But in our case, for instance, if I tell you our experience, uh, we have a very unique land law. Land is not a proper, it's not private property. It's a property of state and people. So if the government want the land, it just uh, give compensation, nothing else. So as a result of this, uh, nowadays, our cities, for instance, if you take Gondar, uh, they are acquiring land in the peri urban areas. If I share the slide, you can't see this. This is the Gondor city administration. The inner one is the city with planning boundary, whereas the pink colored one is the surrounding area that the city uh, acquired from very urban dwellers. But as we, but the city is not developed as recommended. Um, illegal settlements are mushrooming. No road. And I think in developing countries like us, the problem is poor planning, lack of capital, and corruption. That's what I want to reflect. Thank you. 
Great, thanks. Those are really important insights. Is there another person from the group that is going to present or is it you three that we're kind of presenting today? There's one more question. Question number four, which Anuprit will answer. Okay. But he is not here right now. Yeah. But maybe we can just start the discussion and maybe we can address the last question in terms of can a segregated city be democratic, right? Maybe that can come up in the discussion. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, based on your really sharp reflections, all three of you, how much you kind of were able to reflect upon ideology is playing a role. Because, um, Hassan, you were bringing up kind of these different interpretations of equity, right? So, injustice. So, if we think about kind of the, the, the image of Lady Justice, right? That woman who has the blindfold over her eyes and she's got um, her hands out on both sides, kind of uh, indicating that everything can be even if justice is actually um, executed. Does anybody actually believe that justice is unbiased, right? I think we have to sort of ask ourselves that. And many philosophers have kind of brought this up in terms of thinking about justice for whom and uh, there's this quick story called the parable of the flute where you have three children in a village. Um, there's one flute and all kids think that they have, all three children think they have the right to it. One of the children argues, well, I built the flute, so I should get it. One of them argues, well, I know how to play the flute, so I should get it. And the other one argues, well, I don't have any toys, so I should get it. So the question is, do you think justice should be redistributed? So giving it to the child without toys? Do you think it should be based on work? So utilitarian, right? Or do you think it should be based on work? So kind of more of a, I own it, it's mine, um, uh, sort of a property rights based, or should it be utilitarian based on the fact that there's a child who can play it? So those are three kind of basic ways of understanding justice or the right to the city or the right to the flute, however you wanna think about it. And there's many discussions about that. So that's where I wanna suggest we maybe need to go back to that ideological matrix to kind of think about what, what is being actually argued for in this video. Is it a distribution for all? Is it distribution for those who pay taxes? Is it distribution for those who um, have power? Um, maybe we can reflect a little bit on that. What do you, what do you all think? Uh, may I add something? Yes, please. <laughs> We should also. Uh, have we can't really hear you. You're <laughs> a bit blocked. Uh, am I audible? It's a bit hard to hear. Can you get closer to the microphone if you have one? Yeah. Uh, is it fine now? Yes. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, before uh, uh, considering the segregation, it is very important to know the context in the developing realm where the population is segregated into human body population and biological body population. And democracy works for the human body population and not for the biological body population uh, because the policies and their execution is directly influenced by the economic and uh, political elites and the cities are segregated in such a manner uh, that the access to the resources are limited only to the powerful, uh, whether they are the bureaucrats or politicians or the rich. I have an example from Chandigarh. Uh, there is a road uh, in the center of the city known as Madhya Marg or the Central Road. It is segregating the city into two parts, the northern part is inhabited by the rich people, whereas in the southern part, poor people are living. Uh, there is a plan of uh, metro uh, for the past 20 years, but the metro is only in the papers and it is not uh, uh, coming to the city. The reason is that the elites don't want to compromise with the heritage of the city. In the name of the politics of the heritage, as you know, Chandigarh is uh, a planned city and it was planned by Lee Carbuzier, a French architect. Mm -hmm. And the northern elite population, they don't want the 
metro rail uh, connection in the city because they think that it will ruin the uh, city because uh, the Chandigarh was planned for 5 lakh population and the present population is more than 12 lakh and uh, 1 to 1.5 lakh population is of the migrants uh, which are not on the records. So the poor prefer to live uh, in the nearby suburbs or the cities or you can say villages and they need uh, a rapid uh, transportation system uh, but they, but the elites are influential and they, they are not allowing uh, the metro to come. Similarly, uh, there are cycle tracks in Chandigarh, but in the southern part, the cycle tracks are used by the vendors and there is a lot of fight for the public space, uh, whereas uh, the northern part is having good open public spaces. Uh, so, uh, I think that segregated city cannot be uh, democratic in nature uh, because the population is already segregated into human body population and biological body population. So, that's all from my side. Thank you. Hmm. Very interesting um, reflections there. And I don't think I understand the context 100%, but I think what you're essentially speaking to is that the, the local context matters 100% and that the local governance context is very important to understand in terms of actually understanding what democracy can be and what it actually is. Are there other kind of comments or perspectives? I was personally like really motivated by the, the video. I thought it was quite interesting and I've, um, I've heard uh, him speak before. He's, he's kind of Gail Penalusa. He's like a greatest hits kind of guy, like Jan Gale. He goes around and, and tells the story of Bogota. Um, and, and I think it's a really powerful story because um, what he's essentially talking about is how he, as mayor, took some kind of top down decisions to reallocate space. So if we want to think about the um, mobility matrix and the different ideologies that come to play. He was really in many ways in both speech and action advocating for a leftist or progressive approach, acknowledging that there were kind of neoliberal undertones and that um, property rights were very difficult. So he kind of spoke to the different street fights that occurred and continue to occur in Bogota, but showed how um, he and his uh, government were able to kind of overcome them. What we're missing is kind of the local perspective. Like, what do everyday citizens think about this? Like, was it popular? Um, do some people feel like they got priced out of their neighborhoods? Uh, did they feel like they were involved in the decision-making process? I think that would be really interesting to hear more about in terms of the Bogota perspective. Because what the literature shows us is that there were also a lot of neoliberal forces at play. Um, and that property rights and property prices have become kind of a contested issue, as they always are in these urban contexts. Um, are there other reflections about that? Kind of, do you think that these ideas presented in the in the video could actually work in your own city? Or some of the cities that were brought up in the discussion before? I could quickly maybe yeah, just, oh. go ahead. Uh, reflect more on the on the last question around segregated segregated city being democratic, and I would agree yeah. with with the group that um, presented that it that it can't. Um, and I was thinking about one one aspect of it, which is that if you have a very segregated city where you've got a part of big part of the population that is excluded from good education and from higher education as well as economic opportunities then you or this is just my um kind of interpretation of it um then those who would be in administrative government as well as those who are in dominating the political spaces would only be would have a certain lived reality that is not reflective of the large majority of city uh, of people in the city. So even if people in local government and in the kind of more administrative 
posts have good intentions in terms of creating mobility for all across segregated spaces. They have a lot of blind spots because they come from one certain lived reality. And so even with good intentions, their attempts might fail at creating mobility that is inclusive for everyone because they don't know the experience mm -hmm. from multiple um, perspectives. Mm. Do you think that the systems that are put in place in Bogota could have potential group for being inclusive in democratic systems? I guess potentially more than more than other places, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what processes um, kind of followed the rollout of the of the uh, bus rapid transport system, etc. Mm -hmm. I know in in Cape Town, where the bus rapid transport system has been modelled to some extent on the um, on the Bogota example, um, been a lot of um, and happiness around, for example, where, which areas they've prioritized first. So it's the more wealthy parts of the city that have been prioritized for the BRT, um, while people coming from the poor areas really still have to struggle on poorly functioning uh, public transport systems. I guess mm. in Cape Town, having tried to copy that model, something hasn't quite gone right. Mm. Um, I guess the system can work. It's how you, how do you roll it out? Who's included in the decisions of where, um, vo what voices do you include in that process potentially? Sure. Absolutely. I think these are, these are the key questions, right? Um, so asking a question of what is democracy becomes quickly kind of difficult to, to respond to and to answer. But if we think about kind of those basic questions, ooh, that you brought up, <laughs> then uh, then we can start to kind of drill down into to processes, whether they be right at the local level or at the city level or at the national level. And uh, these are kind of the street fights that I think we need to start thinking about and digging into. Who gets public transit first? Is it a, a broader rollout or is it a rollout that seems to be based on kind of elite structures? Um, and oftentimes we see kind of tendencies of elite capture when we have kind of new green systems rolled out. Um, and that's always something to keep an eye out for, right? And that kind of goes back to the concept of carbon gentrification. Who gets to live in the, the carbon light areas? Who doesn't get to live in them? Um, so these are really important ideas to keep in mind when thinking about these processes. Are there other reflections or ideas that should be brought to light here in the discussion? I had. I had a comment on the ideological dimension that when you look at the video clearly, as you said, it's it's a leftist or, or a socialist perspective, you know, and he has a lot of trust in government that the government should buy up land around the city and, and develop it in develop it for for the for the, for the good of, of everyone. But and then when you contrast it to the Ethiopian example that Nigusi was talking about, when what you actually tend to get in the developing world is 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 a lot of corruption, and 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 so so it it might very easily backfire. So so so, so the choices are uh, not that clear always. It's it's uh, yeah. No, oh, and I think that's really important to understand who actually governs, who owns these processes, and which bodies then get to actually be mobile within those systems. Right. So we always have to go back to these uh, questions that Katinka was actually kind of bringing up in her last comments of like, who's involved in the processes, who owns them, who are they for, to kind of think about which mobilities are just or potentially unjust. And it could always be that, you know, in those street fights at very individual levels, we have uh, really different perspectives. So um, it looks like we um, kind of need to, how are we doing timing wise? Can we wrap up or are we we still have a few minutes uh but uh you yeah, know you're you obviously have two two different things going on at the same time well, here, i'm, so, I'm uh, okay uh, like if she starts to scream <laughs> then i'll just mute and somebody else can take over but she's yeah. uh, so far uh, kind of satisfied so.
just let us know if you need to to, to yeah. shift attention there. But uh, now, uh, great. Uh, um, I mean, I don't want to cut in uh, with the students' uh, comments, but uh, one thing I've, I've had on my mind, and uh, I mean, I also think uh, Enrique Peñalosa is quite an inspirational figure. We've actually had him here in Bergen a few years ago, and I think he's been on a lot of tours talking about yeah. this, and I recognize many of the same phrases, you know, the a person on a thirty dollar bike versus a person on thirty thirty thousand dollar car. Right. Some of these right. his key phrases that I think he repeats a lot. But but he's quite inspirational, and I think it's <clears throat> it's a great story. Um, one thing I wanted to to ask you, Natalie, if, um, so what we've been talking about transport and mobility uh, related issues here, but uh, but what what about the importance of of public space or public spaces for for mm. democracy and social justice? Mm. Uh, because that's that's uh, I mean here we're talking about talking about justice in terms of distribution of road space, mm. uh, but there's also something about sort of um, you know public public space and how people can can congregate and meet across different mm -hmm. social groups etc and, and the importance of that if you could could, could, could uh, i'd be interested in hearing your perspective on that yeah absolutely well um, in the first question of like the rights question i mean i inevitably think about david harvey's uh, text the right to the city right so so who who gets to have access to public space how much public space do we actually have who gets to use it and at which cost and I think these questions are actually incredibly contemporary and relevant today when we see these protests and we see how folks, despite kind of lockdowns and, and orders to stay at home, are taking to the streets and sort of suggesting we have the right to be here, we have the right to speak, we have the right to congregate, and our spaces, whether they're private or public, should be much safer. So I think there's something about intersectionality here. And maybe many of you have heard this term of intersectionality, meaning that if we're talking about the right to mobility, we actually also have to be thinking about different abilities. So race, socioeconomic factors, um, ability to, to walk or to, uh, to use your body functionally, gender, um, and, and kind of historic burdens as well. So all of these play into uh, the concept of kind of urban development and mobility. And um, who is it? Mimi Scheller has written this really uh, incredible text that I, I'm going to send a link out to, and I wish I would have made one of the readings, about kind of just mobilities and even mobilities or uneven mobilities. And what she, is actually, what she essentially is suggesting is that we need to have much more focus and kind of justice in mobility. Who has the ability to move around? Who has the ability to be in a public space? Um, what are the kind of historic burdens that people might bear? And how do we rectify that within our, our transformations to kind of deep carbonization? And I think these, these conversations are, are coming up all the time. And I'm not going to suggest that I have answers, but I think we need to kind of ask those questions and keep them with us as we're looking at the kind of very diverse local perspectives that we have to deal with. Maybe some uh, some of you in the course have some reflections on this as well. I just had a thought on the on the use of public space and the kind of right to public spaces. How um, one thing is kind of just access and the difficulty for some people to getting to get to certain parts of a city. Um, but another thing is that kind of underlying sense of feeling welcome mm -hmm. and included. Absolutely. That, that acts often as a big barrier in cities where, you know, if you have a fancy downtown and you live in the poor areas on the fringes of the city and you come into the city center and you feel completely alienated, uh, you feel people look at you or you feel, you know, that you don't know how things work, so you don't, you know, fit into the space. And I think that's also a really important part of, yeah, that we need to think about how do we create spaces that are inclusive for all as part of creating more um, inclusive mobility networks. Totally. So in environmental justice literature, we oftentimes talk about kind of um, uh, procedural justice, right, or distributive justice. So procedural justice is about who's involved in decision making. Do you feel like you have a right or a voice to actually decide how public space, whether it be green spaces or public transit are actually designed, used and implemented? 
And then uh, we have issues of kind of distribution, like who has access? So in the case you brought up about Cape Town, who has access to the new BRT system when it's rolled out? Um, but we also have something about abilities and kind of cultural comfort, who feels included, who feels recognized. So kind of recognitional justice um, in these processes as well. So they're very key to kind of understanding how um, just transitions to deep car decarbonization can actually occur. And, and what, what kind of public and democratic space could actually look like. And I'm not sure that there's just one solution there, right? It's gonna be uh, quite local and it involves a lot of listening and, and um, kind of both bottom up and well steered processes. That's at least what the literature is showing. And I saw that there were some links being distributed in the, in the chat while we were talking. How about uh, reflections from others? Sid, do you have any reflections you want to add here? Oh, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm also sort of just uh, struck by the, the question of what, what it is that we can possibly compare across cities and not. We had um, a Campbell 2007, the Planner's Triangle came up yesterday in Jens's uh, module around this conflict in sustainable development and planning right. or social, environmental, and economic. Uh, uh, aspects and and I guess these work differently in different cities so uh, there are of course a lot of commonalities but to what extent we can take lessons from one and transfer to the other if there's principles for that I think just mobility is a really useful way to think about that I'm also struck by um, I met I wrote a piece also and I used to be in Chennai and um, uh, Enrique Penelosa came there and we had quite a few discussions we even had a, a initiative called Walking Classes Unite going that was doing pedestrian audits of streets and how those arguments pan out there um, compared to say Copenhagen is quite different. It's just getting the space and agency to get people together and make a demand that can be heard in some way and getting that off the ground is so tricky. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the part of this that the flip side if you like of the kind of contestation is all of the bits that are absent that don't get into the public debate. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to work with exclusion, with absence, um, given that there are these power differentials. Sure, well, there's always the idea of non-participation, right? So that folks don't wanna participate because they've felt traditionally excluded or they don't see the, that their voice has been heard, so why should they even bother? And that's always quite interesting. That in itself, I would suggest, is kind of a protest, right? To not participate is giving your voice in one way or another, just in a different way. Um, but in terms of exclusion, I think uh, we have to kind of uh, work as, as planners, if we're thinking in kind of a solutions-oriented perspective, we have to actively work as planners to reach out and to hear voices on a one-to-one -one basis. So one of the projects I'm working on right now is in kind of a, a uh, challenged uh, housing area, you could say marginalized social housing area in Copenhagen, and uh, what, we, what I have spent my time on is actually going around and talking with individuals. And of course, talking with planners and experts as well, but really trying to listen to groups and having one-on-one -on -one meetings with youth who feel very marginalized based on kind of some park planning and, and new implementation that's been going on in terms of the green spaces. And by bringing those voices and different perspectives to light, we can learn a lot and we can have discussions What's always tricky is that despite the fact that you go out and try to listen and raise voices, you can have kind of the unintended consequence of raising hopes that those voices will actually be heard. And that's never anything that you can actually guarantee. Because at the local level, you might have really kind of democratic, inclusive uh, engagement processes, yet those local um, decision-making processes can be completely squashed by kind of like top-down processes, either through the housing company or through kind of like city-led politics or national politics as it might be in a Danish context because of this ghetto law. Um, so that I think is the real tricky part is how do you actually execute just um, engagement and uh, planning with local groups when you can't necessarily ensure that the end process will actually be just. Um, so that's maybe a question that we can keep floating um, or maybe other people have insights in as well. I think these are really important and kind of difficult questions that we're bringing up. It would be lovely if we had answers. 
<laughs> yeah, but unless anyone has a burning, uh, burning uh, thing to say, I think uh, this is a good place to, to stop. We're a bit, a few minutes over time as well, and uh, and Natalie also has other things to do. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, um, I, I, I want to thank you. I mean, I think this has been this has been really interesting, and I, I'm really impressed by how you managed to to to, to, to stay clear and and, and focused <laughs> with multiple tasks at hand. <laughs> so so thank you so much for that. And maybe we should unmute okay. all of us uh, and then give uh, Natalie a round of applause. Uh, we usually do. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to, to meet you this morning and actually to use my my brain in a different way. I was just reflecting on that with my. Um, my husband during one of the breaks that it's been so nice to to get back to teaching so <laughs>